All right, I've talked to a number of people this week about who they want to win the Super Bowl. I think the question is, is who, who does God want to win the Super Bowl? There are 176 references to rams in the Bible. There are zero references to patriots. God's favor is clear. However, every time rams are mentioned in the Bible, they're being slaughtered. <clears throat> so we'll see how that works out, all right? The most sacred symbol in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, is a tree. A sprawling, shade-bearing, 90-year-old American elm. Tourists drive for miles around to see it. People gather for photos beneath it. Arborists take great care of it. There are other trees that are fuller, greener, but none are as cherished as this one. It's cherished not for its appearance, but its endurance. Timothy McVeigh parked his death-laden truck just yards from it. His malice killed 168 people, injured 850 people. It blew up the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, and it left the tree covered in rubble. Everybody figured it was gone. Nobody gave it a second thought. And then sprouts began to come through the damaged bark. Green leaves pushed through the gray soot. Life resurrected from an acre of death. People noticed the tree modeled the resilience they wanted to experience. And so they named the tree the survivor tree. Timothy and McVeigh still rock our worlds. They still inexcusably maim and scar. We want to imitate the tree, survive the evil, rise above the ruins, escape the anger, overcome the thirst for revenge. But how? David offers us some ideas. Saul McVeighs his way into David's life. He's trying to kill David, and David flees into the Dead Sea Desert. Remember, David has been anointed to become the next king of Israel. So the spirit comes upon him and he wins a great battle against the giant Goliath. They defeat the Philistines and David becomes a household name overnight. The people love him. Saul's impressed, so he hires him to be one of the commanders in his army. And David is very successful. Again, powered by the Holy Spirit. Saul gives him his daughter, McCall, in marriage. His son, Jonathan, grows to love David and becomes his best friend. David has all this going for him, but Saul becomes jealous and suspicious, so he tries to kill him at least six times, we note it. So David flees into the desert, and he's on the run. For 10 years, he's on the run from David. 600 loyalists gather around David, and they all run with him from cave to cave. David had to be bitter. How did David rise above the desire for revenge against Saul? How did he overcome life's most subtle temptation, the desire to seek revenge? Before delving into David's life, let's take an inventory on the Saul's in our lives. Whether you're a teenager Single, married, widowed, divorced, Christian, non-Christian. We all have this desire to retaliate against those who wrong us. What do we call it? We call it my rights. I have rights. I was wronged. 
or we call it justified retaliation. What they did was wrong. I need to get even. There needs to be justice. How does God feel about it? He calls it revenge. Apostle Paul writes, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Why don't you read this with me? Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. God commands us to leave vengeance in his hands. We seek revenge when we've been injured by someone. We've been wronged. We feel a need to get even. The pattern of revenge is always the same. It begins with an injury and is completed when our offender has been hurt in return. David was given an opportunity to get revenge against Saul. Turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel 24. If you want to use our Bibles under the seats, it's on page 292. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. Now, David fled from Saul into the desert around the Dead Sea. It has to be one of the ten worst places in the world. The Israelis have discovered natural gas under the desert floor. Uh, they've put large chemical plants there. People come to work there, but they haven't been able to do anything about the desert terrain. In the brick oven heat, lizards lie behind rocks, scorpions slither through the dirt, and snakes sh seek shade in the caves. They can't get anyone to live there. This is where David spent 10 years of his life on the run. And Getty is the lowest place on the earth. Rainwater flows down into En Gedi, so it's actually an oasis in the desert. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He chooses 3,000 of the best soldiers in Israel. He means business. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Little does he know that David and his men are hiding deep back in the cave. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Their words, masked in a veil of spirituality, encouraged David to retaliate. One thrust of the blade will bring Saul's tyranny and their running to an end. But David signals for the men to hold back. You know, often God gets blamed for some things that he has nothing to do with. David's soldiers desired to get revenge against Saul, and they said to David, this is God's timing. This is his will. David couldn't completely give up the opportunity to get even. He had to come close enough to get just a taste of the sweetness of revenge. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. David had barely slid his knife back into its sheath when God pricked his conscience Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. David was sensitive to little sins, types of sins that we would probably overlook. In fact, he felt so strongly about this small act of revenge that he confessed it to his men and persuaded them to leave vengeance to God. 
With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. When Saul left the cave, David followed after him with a, a piece of robe in hand uh, to talk to him and show him his innocence. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself <clears throat> with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off a corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See, there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you've done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil de deeds. So my hand will not touch you. Then verse 16, when David finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I've treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king <clears throat> and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to this stronghold. From this account, you might get the impression that when you're wronged, you should just kind of eat it and let it go. But you have a right to speak up and declare the truth. That's what David did. He said, Saul, you're wronging me. I haven't done anything to harm you. I'm not trying to kill you. He didn't take vengeance into his own hands, but he didn't move back to the palace. He and his men went back to the stronghold. Do the same. Give grace, but if need be, keep your distance. You can forgive an abusive husband without living with him. Society can dispense grace and prison terms. Offer the child molester a second chance, but keep him off the playgrounds. Forgiveness is not foolishness. David had still another opportunity to seek revenge against Saul, but again, he did not take vengeance into his own hands. A couple chapters later, 1 Samuel 26, we find Saul's back to hunting David. David and one of his top soldiers slipped into Saul's camp in the middle of the night. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. Again, notice he's being told, This is God's will. But David will not have it. Rather than taking Saul's life, he takes his spear and his jug of water and sneaks out of camp. Then after they were far enough away, David shouts to Saul. He says, look, I've got your spear and your jug. I could have killed you, but I didn't. He says in verse 23, the Lord rewards everyone for their righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I value your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. Once again, David did not yield to life's most subtle temptation to take vengeance into our own hands. Think of the souls in your life. Those who have wronged you and inflicted pain on you. It's one thing to give grace to friends, but to give grace to those who harm you? Could you? Could you imitate David? Most of us find it hard to forgive. I find it hard to forgive. 
We forgive the one-time offenders. We dismiss the parking place takers. They sneak in ahead of you. We can even let go of the purse snatchers. We can forgive the misdemeanors, but the felonies? People that have harmed us over and over again? The souls who take our youth, our retirement, our health. Were that scoundrel to seek shade in your cave? Or be lying asleep at your feet? Would you do what David did? Could you forgive the scum who hurt you? What can we learn from David? Two things. One, since people are sinful, expect to be, to be mistreated and anticipate our feelings. The Apostle Paul says that God has written his law in our hearts. Every human being you see in this world has God's law written in their hearts. That's why there's a worldwide sense of justice. When things are wrong, people say, that's not right. So when you're hurt, when you've been wronged, a natural instinct grow, wells up within you to get even. This has to be corrected. So if you understand that the urge will come. Our guard will be up when we're wronged and will be less likely to impulsively lash back. Two, and the most important thing I want you to take away this morning, surrender the desire for revenge to God. Leave vengeance to God. God is the only one who can assess accurate judgments on people. He's the only one that knows minds and hearts. So leave judgment to him. Don't insist on getting even. I'll do the judging, says God. Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Don't take vengeance into your own hands. Vengeance fixes your attention on life's ugliest moments. Score settling freezes your stare at cruel events in your past. Is that where you want to look? Will rehearsing and reliving your hurts make you a better person? Of course not. It'll destroy you. I'm thinking of the comedy routine. Joe is talking to Jerry, his friend, and they're talking about a common friend. And Joe says to his friend, he says, I hate it when that guy, when every time he talks to me, he pokes me in the chest. It just drives me crazy. Then he smiles and he pulls out this bottle of nitroglycerin. He says, see this? I'm going to hang it around my neck. It's going to dangle right here in that spot where he always pushes me. Next time he sticks his finger there, he's going to pay for it. <laughs> Not as much as Joe's going to pay for it, right? <laughs> Enemy destroyers need two graves. An eye for an eye becomes a neck for a neck. A reputation for a reputation. When does it stop? It stops when one person imitates David's God-dominated mind. David faced Saul the way he faced Goliath, by focusing more on God. When the soldiers in the cave urged David to kill Saul, God occupied David's thoughts. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, and, or lay a hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. When David came out of the cave and called after Saul, he said the same thing. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the, what? Lord's anointed. 
When David saw, spared Saul a second time, he continued with this belief. But David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? In these two scenes, I count six times when David called Saul the Lord's anointed. He saw not Saul the enemy, but he saw Saul the anointed of the Lord. He saw Saul as no less than a child of God, anointed by God. He thought about God more than he thought about Saul. He saw his avenger through God's eyes. This is one of the reasons David is called a man after God's own heart. He focused on God more. This has been the theme of this series. When David faced the challenge of Goliath or the desire to get revenge against Saul, he thought of God more. When we take vengeance into our own hands, we rob God of an opportunity of working in someone's life. God always uses his correction to draw people towards salvation. When God punishes people for sin, they are always given plenty of time to repent. First book of the Bible, Genesis 15, God is talking to Abraham. He's, the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers. Uh, Abraham is considered the father of the Israel nation. Will be in a country, not their own. He's talking about Egypt. And that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation, that's Egypt, they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. The Amorites are the Canaanites that the Israelites killed and drove out of the land of Canaan. If you're not a Christian, you say, this I don't get. The bloodshed in the Bible. How the, it can be okay for the Israelites to be killing people. Or David killing Philistines. I just don't get it. Well, remember, God gave them 400 years to repent. In David's case, it's 700 years to repent. These are people that came from the same stock as the Israelites. They knew all about God, yet they embraced some of the most horrendous uh, ways of living that ever known to man. Uh, sexual orgies, uh, putting children to death and offering fire in, in the fire to Moloch, worship of Satan. God gives them years to repent. When we take vengeance into our own hands, we don't give God an opportunity to work in people's lives. Revenge takes God out of the equation. We say, I'm not sure you can handle this one, God. I think you might punish them too little or too slowly. I'll, I'll take this one. Is that really what you want to say? Jesus didn't. No one had a clearer sense of right and wrong than the perfect son of God. Yet Peter says about him, when they hurled their insults at him, Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. We're not to give in to life's most subtle temptation to take vengeance into our own hands. But we are to forgive. Dare we ask God for grace, yet refuse to give it? We've been given grace, so we are to give grace. We survive when we've been wronged and experienced injustice because we imitate the survivor tree. We reach our roots beyond the bomb zone. We tap into moisture beneath the explosion. We dig deeper and deeper until we draw moisture from the mercy of God. We don't give in to life's most subtle temptation to take vengeance into our own hands. We leave vengeance to God. We re surrender the desire for revenge to God. We, like Saul, have been given grace. 
we like David can freely give it. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for these stories about David. He's called a man after your own heart. We, we sometimes wonder why. We see one of the reasons. He didn't take vengeance into his own hands. He left that to you. We want to be like him. We've all had souls in our own lives, people that have wronged us, hurt us. We have scars in our lives to prove it. But we want to forgive them. I want you to tell God that right now. If you've been convicted today, maybe there's somebody that's hurt you deeply and you just can't forgive them. Would you tell God today that you'd like to try? You're going to quit thinking about getting even? You're going to leave that to him? If you've never given your life to Christ, this would be a great time. You say, Christ, I believe you're the son of God. You died for my sins. I see that you did not take revenge when you had a chance. I want to do the same as you. Would you come into my life? I'll give you a minute to pray. Father, thank you that you are a just God, a holy God, and you say you will right all wrong someday. So we're going to leave it in your hands. You're the only one that can do it correctly anyway. We're going to loosen our grip on the desire for revenge and vengeance. In Jesus' name.